late afternoon session. Um, we hope we will be able to keep you here until 1800 when, uh, when we have the deadline. We have a range of, uh, of excellent speakers um, and I'm, I'm personally looking very much forward to, uh, to listen uh, to them. My name is, uh, is Moen Smith. I'm the Deputy Assistant Director General for Communication and Information at UNESCO who has uh, organized this workshop together with Transparency International and Article 19. Um, as you may have just seen just before, we, we have we've actually only known here in the very last minute which one of our panelists who would actually be, uh, be able to, to join us here on the podium. And I think, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Ruxana Nayarakara from Sri Lanka, from Transparency International there, will not be, be able to join us. We, um, we're celebrating this year the 60th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which also includes the Article 19, the one setting down the rule of the right that we have to seek actively to impart, to express ourselves, and to receive voluntarily uh, information, and that regardless of frontiers. And that whole uh, issue of the right to freedom of expression also comprises what is sometimes being called freedom of information, or right to information, or the right to access public health information. And we're going to focus uh, on this particular aspect uh, this afternoon, and we're going to do it with a particular de development perspective. Because we have worked uh, over the last couple of years at UNESCO, and colleagues have worked in, in many universities and many NGOs all over the world, in order to establish and to, to really look into the correlations between freedom of expression, good governance, transparency, accountability, and then also development, human development, social and economic development. Um, we are about to publish a book about these issues uh, at UNESCO, and uh, hopefully, we had hoped to be able to bring it here, but unfortunately we could not, but that will be out very, very soon, and it will be posted uh, also on the, the IGF uh, website, so that you will have a chance to, to download it there. It will be for free. We know that many governments have over the last years introduced legislation that allows freedom of information, access to public health information. But there are also many governments who really do not want to do that, who, who fear about it, who what we think, think very backwards about the, the benefits that it will give to actually allow a country's citizens to access the information which is held by the public authorities. We're going to have uh, to start the panel today with, the, with a, a keynote speech given to us by, by Dr. Ansari, who is the Central Information Commissioner here in India. And I think Dr. Ansari will, will demonstrate to us how the right to information can really be a very powerful tool for empowerment, for uh, mobilization, and for participation, and thus uh, help to ensure a stronger democracy. I think we also know that when we talk about freedom of expression, access to public health information, it's not just about getting the legislation right. It's also about having the legislation applied in its full way. We know for many countries that we have very good legislation, but less good uh, application of that legislation. And it's also a matter of building the capacity, both of those who are set to administer this uh, legislation and of those who are supposed to be benefiting from it. And I hope uh, Professor Ansari will take us into both of these uh, aspects. India got its uh, right to information law just three years ago, and we know there has been a surge of requests for information since that law has been put, uh, put into practice. Um, how the internet is playing an active role in this, I think, is also one of the issues that I hope Professor Ansari would, will uh, share his experience on with us. So no more from my side, Professor Ansari. The floor is yours. Thank you. Fellow panelists, distinguished participants, I'm extremely 
happy to be associated with this IGF function and I am grateful to UNESCO, particularly ADG Professor Khan for inviting me to speak to you on the issue of access to public health information with a development perspective. As you can see from the topic, the theme itself, access to public health information, and the second part talks about with a development perspective. I have, I propose to uh, make a presentation on first, right to information and its relationship with good governance, that is the elements of good governance as identified in the Right to Information Act are transparency, accountability, and containment of corruption. And we will see how access to information in the last three years have impacted improvement in good governance through changes, rather desirable changes in the elements of good governance. In the second part, I would also like to dwell on how Right to Information Act has been used by the citizens for improving the indicators of development. The major indicators which I have identified are poverty alleviation, empowerment programs, mainly education and health, that is human capital, implementation of programs for weaker section, economic infrastructure, and finally, the environment. But to begin with, let me make a mention of how this revolution has all come about. In the first instance, I would like to say that there are some forces, both from within and also outside, which have been impacting the entire development process, and that has led to paradigm shift in development process. As UNESCO has been emphasizing on sharing of knowledge, information, mainly on the ground that the knowledge is critical for development, and therefore the societies, the individuals, and the countries which have more, uh, which have, which possess knowledge, which are able to make use of new knowledge and ideas, it is they who are able to forge ahead. So there has been a force being applied both internally as well as from external sources, and the information revolution, the creation and, talk, and what we talk about, the knowledge society, that has created a kind of necessity or compelling situation for bringing about in a legislation for allowing free access to information. But at the same time, what we have observed, especially in our India, is that India has been a democratic country, and it is well understood that the democracy requires informed citizenry and transparency of information to enable the people to access information, make use of the information for the political and economic participation. So what we have seen is that corresponding to the UN Charter 19, which allows for access to information, freedom of expression and speech, we have under the Constitution of India, uh, Section 19, which allowed for uh, freedom of expression and freedom of speech. But we never had right to know. Although this is very much a part in the UN Charter, but in our constitutional provisions, access to information, right to know, has never been emphasized as a result of which official secretariat has dominated. So consequently what happened was that most of the programs that have been implemented throughout the country, they have yielded very poor results. A study by the Planning Commission way back in 89 demonstrated that of the total expenditure being incurred on poverty alleviation program, at least only 15% was reaching to the poor. This was very well announced by the former prime minister and which uh, indicated the extent of corruption in this country. It was also realized that if 
the corruption is reduced just by another 15 percent, the allocation of funds for poverty alleviation will go up, rather it will be doubled. And with doubling of outlays on poverty alleviation, that may drastically change the scenario insofar as the poverty alleviations are concerned. So there has been greater demand by the civil society at various fora, including in the election campaigns, for more and more access to information in the same light as the UNESCO or the UN Charter or even the constitutional provision under the 19 has articulated. And therefore, beginning from 1977 to 2004, at least nine of the Indian major states in one form or the other, they passed some legislation giving legal rights to the people to access information. And it was found that the results were very much encouraging. People began to participa participate in the development process. Uh, there was a two-way sharing of information between the uh, government departments as well as from the individuals and the people increasingly participated in all the implementation programs. As a result, the outcomes were seen to be much better than what it were before. And therefore, in 2005, the Right to Information Act was passed and it was uniformly implemented in all the states, except JNK. Now, since then, we see that there has been a massive response to the RTI Act and the RTI uh, is harnessed as a tool for accessing information and on the basis of which people began to participate in the political and economic decision-making processes. The RTI Act has clearly articulated as, what to, uh, as to what are the objectives of this Act. It says that the democracy requires transparency of information and uh, to enable the people to seek accountability of the government and improve the performance. So the transparency, accountability, containment of corruption, and also enabling the people to participate in what, Smith, you say about dialogues, encouraging people to participate in all the development processes. So what we see is that the RTI Act has already indicated at least 17 parameters which requires all the public authorities to proactively disclose as much information as possible, so much so that an information seeker, a citizen, doesn't have to ask for the information. So beginning from the vision and mission of an organization to the various activities, the budgetary processes, the decision-making processes, everything has to be uh, put in the public domain in a way that the uh, disclosure of information becomes a rule uh, and exemption from disclosure is an exception. And in this spirit, now that the information seekers have been uh, entitled even to observe the decision-making processes, uh, examine and uh, inspect the documents, and also ask for any set of information. And then we also have the institution of information commission. The information commissions have played the role of an, uh, inf uh, an enforcer of the provisions and also educator to both the information seeker as well as the information providers. So what we have seen is that because of there is penalty provisions, because the commission can impose penalty, can also recommend disciplinary action against uh, the information providers, uh, we see that the, the act has been fully implemented and the information are fully provided and the commissions have order for disclosure of even some such documents like file notings, cabinet papers, and uh, the decision-making processes relating to the tendering process, allotment of uh, all the uh, uh, benefits which are given on a right basis. So we see a situation where there is unprecedented level of disclosure of information by the public authorities. And that has positively impacted in providing the information and seek the accountability of the government and the public servants. And as a result, we see that the accountability has been improving. In areas which were uh, hardly accessible to the people are the media. Now, people can access the information and seek accountability and question even the government authorities as to why certain action has been taken and what grounds action has been taken and what has been its outcome. 
And therefore, we see that the, the accountability in the various departments, beginning from the distribution of subsidized rations to admission processes, uh, teacher uh, attendance, doctors and nurses attendance, and even uh, distribution of subsidized products like petroleum products, everything has come into the public domain. And because of the people pressure in the entire decision-making process and implementation of his scheme, accountability have also improved. So what we see is that with the increased uh, disclosure of information and uh, the information seeker having access to the entire records relating to the decision-making process and implementation, accountability has improved and the people's participation in the decision-making process have also increased and the people have also not only confined to seek, uh, to seek information only about the economic and social services, but they have begun to also ask for uh, the action and behavior of the politicians. If you recall in the recent uh, elections in different states, people have asked for about the uh, assets of the politicians and how it has multiplied in a short period, whereas the national income has not increased. People have also asked how the money allocated to the different constituencies under the local area development has been in, uh, utilized. They have also asked for as to how much they have been working uh, when the parliaments and the national assemblies are in the uh, uh, in operation or when they are functioning. So it means that not only the public servants and the public bodies, but also the politicians are being questioned and the people are therefore participating in the entire political process and that we see that almost 50% of the politicians are hardly re being re-elected again, which was not the case before. So what we see that the people have begun to participate with armed with information in the decision making processes, uh, including they are challenging and questioning the politicians and we uh, see that there is unprecedented level of disclosure of information and also there is sign of considerable improvement and that has also resulted in reduction in corruption also. Transparency International has demonstrated that in India in the last three years the corruption uh, reduction score has improved from 2.99 uh, percentage points to that of 3. Uh, four four uh, after an initial rise of 3.5 uh, uh, in two, uh, 2007. That shows that there has been a reduction in corruption to the extent of 15% uh, or so. A study conducted by Transparency International and one of the uh, NGOs uh, uh, here in India, uh, they have also administered questionnaires and found out from the people below the poverty line that at least uh, who have said, uh, at least 40% of them have said that the corruption in India in the last three years after the implementation of the Right to Information Act has declined. And this is, Mr. Chairman, also reflected uh, from the two startling facts uh, that in the last three years, because of the various poverty alleviation programs being very well executed, implemented in the rural areas, migration of people from the rural to urban areas have decelerated. At the same time, it is also seen that the long-term uh, reduction uh, in, uh, uh, in poverty has been about 0.8 percentage points. But only in three years, this reduction has doubled. That is, uh, it is uh, 1.6 percentage points, and this is the finding of the National Planning Commission, which has now shown that in the last three years, such a massive change has uh, occurred after the implementation of the RTI Act. So what I'm saying, relating to the first part of uh, the theme, that is access to public health information, is that the RTI has brought out considerable revolution in uh, putting in public domain unprecedented level of uh, information. The people have right to seek accountability of the public servants, including the politicians, and these have resulted in better implementation of the various uh, program. Now I come to uh, the second part of my presentation, that is RTI and development indicators. For assessing the impact of right to know on uh, development, as I mentioned, I have identified uh, five parameters. 
And that shows in relation to the poverty alleviation. Let me briefly mention that the India has adopted an approach of poverty alleviation uh, which has three broad components. One is income and food security. The second is uh, provision of services at the subsidized rates, that is reduced rates. And the third is empowerment program for the poor. Now, as regards the first aspect is income and food security, the government has implemented very recently uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. Under this scheme, every person below the poverty line, he can demand a job, and the moment he demands the job, it is, has to be provided within 15 days. What I'm trying to say is that even such programs were available in India earlier also, but these programs were never effectively implemented. The benefits never uh, were reaped by those who were entitled for it, because among the beneficiaries, fictitious names used to be included and the benefit would not go to the targeted people. But because of the RTI Act, people who are categorized under the power, uh, below the poverty line, they can ask for, the, info, uh, for uh, the information as to why they have not been offered job when they have been guaranteed for this. And because of this, they are being provided the jobs. Under this scheme, they are provided 100 days jobs and they get uh, wages uh, ranging from uh, 60 uh, rupees per day to that of 80 rupees, which means that every poor has an opportunity to increase his income to the extent of six to 8,000 uh, rupees uh, per annum. And this is in addition to other sources of income. So this much benefit now, which were never reaching the poor before, are now uh, uh, being reached because of the Right to Information Act, because every poor is entitled for certain benefits uh, as and when he asks for it, the, uh, the, the, the benefit is uh, guaranteed to him and he is paid. So this is how uh, the income guarantee has been ensured. Although similar schemes were being uh, implemented before under the wage employment, food for work programs, but they hardly reached the program. As I mentioned to you in the beginning, that even the Planning Commission study showed that there was rampant corruption and there was no way to check unless uh, people were given the right because people had no right earlier. They could not uh, demand for services. They could not hold the government to account for, but now they can seek the accountability. Now, under this uh, 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 scheme also, uh, we have the food security. Now, once the purchasing power is increased, they are entitled to purchase uh, uh, food grains and other necessities uh, from wherever they want. But at the same time, the government has also initiated a uh, midday meals program. And this is universally applicable to all the students who are going to the schools. Now people and the parents, teachers, students being aware of this scheme, they have begun to ask for uh, the quality and the quantity of services, and these are being universally provided. So it meets the nutritional deficiency of uh, the students uh, uh, and those families which are not able to provide the meals, they are now able to uh, see that their children are getting proper meals in the school. So as a result, what has happened is that not only the nutritional deficiency has been taken care of, but the learning attainments of students and the dropout of students have also been checked up. So this is an advantage by giving the food security at all the, in all the schools run by uh, the government. For children who are below six years, there is another scheme, integrated child development scheme where nutritional support is provided to them. So we see that the adults are given the jobs, the school going students are given uh, midday meals. At the same time, small children are also given nutritional support under the ICDS scheme. And at the same time, for the old people, senior citizens, those who are above 60, they are provided old age pension. And that is also a universal program. Anyone who is below the poverty line and uh, is above 60 years, he gets a pension of 500 rupees. In addition, he also gets 10 kgs of food grains per month. Now, having known the entitlements for these schemes, people have begun to claim for these entitlements. And it is under the RTI that they ask that if I 
they, they ask whether or not he is eligible for this, and if he is, then why he has not been provided the benefit. And there are instances when these services have been provided at the doorstep, either when the RTI has been invoked. Because if the service is not provided, they can complain to the Central Information Commission. So the Central Information Commission can take some such action which will penalize the public servant, can also recommend disciplinary action which might jeopardize his uh, career, and also the commission has power to award compensation to the information seeker for any, for any detriment he may have suffered in seeking this kind of information. Because the RTI Act very clearly uh, mentions that for each and every action, administrative or quasi judicial taken by the public authority, the reasons or the grounds should be indicated. So anyone has the right to ask that if I am eligible for certain such benefit, why have I not been provided? So what we see that the number of schemes that had been, uh, uh, had been launched for elevation of poverty, they are being implemented effectively, and uh, which was not the case before. Now, we also have the empowerment programs like uh, uh, human uh, capital, uh, development of human capital through education and health. It was never the case. We have the education for all program. We have uh, the health for all program. But the health centers were never properly run. The doctors and nurses would not be attending properly. Uh, the medicine supplied to them would not be distributed uh, to the beneficiaries. The teachers would not be attending to the classes. There was no way to seek accountability of the teachers. But now people have begun to question about the admission policy, about the examination process, about the recruitment processes, and why the teachers are not coming to the school, or why the doctors are not coming to those centers. And we see that effectively these schemes are being implemented. And wherever the government, which is to provide the minimum infrastructure facilities for running of the schools, they, they question that why when the staff has been sanctioned, the uh, teacher is not appointed. Why? certain facilities have been created or which are uh, uh, to be followed as per the norms and guidelines, why those uh, facilities are not being provided in adherence to those norms and guidelines. So people have begun to question and hold the government and the departments accountable for this. And as a result, we see that there is somewhat better implementation of those schemes. Likewise, we have uh, uh, schemes for empowerment of the weaker sections, Shuruka, Shurul tribe, handicapped, uh, uh, minorities, and other backward uh, communities. For them, the government has reservation policies. For them, the government has scholarships and other support uh, uh, services that are uh, being provided. And we see uh, that all these services are being uh, provided to them because uh, as per their entitlements, they ask for the reasons, and the reasons are to be given. And all those who are eligible for certain services, they are being provided to them. We also have uh, a number of infra uh, economic infrastructure development uh, uh, services. Uh, there are at least more than 250 public sector enterprises and almost uh, many times more than uh, these are uh, uh, the enterprises being run under the state sectors. Now people ask for information about the decision making processes, the processes of uh, uh, tenders uh, and uh, also why uh, the accounts and the dues that are due to them are not being settled on time. People do question the banking, the insurance claims, uh, the power sector, and so many other organizations, they question about both. The choice of technologies, if the technologies are not properly chosen by them, if the quality services are not provided, they will not be able to compete in the competitive world. So they question. Uh, the choice of uh, technology, they question the decision-making processes, they seek for information relating to uh, the various processes uh, are the sources of uh, corruption, which people are by uh, and large are aware of. They can also inspect the documents. So this has created a kind of fear in the minds of the decision-makers and much of uh, the practices which they had to hide the information under the Secrecy Act, they are not able to do that. And as a result, the information is uh, shared and uh, the corrupt practices have been minimized to a great extent. As I mentioned to you, this is also reflected in uh, the corruption rating scores. Finally, uh, most uh, economic projects, 
uh, especially the manufacturing projects, they have to adhere to certain environmental norms because everybody is entitled for a clean environment. And therefore, they question from the regulatory bodies and from the polluting uni units whether or not they have been following uh, the proper norms and guidelines for adherence to the ecological balance. And wherever there are violations, many of the polluting units have either been closed or have been asked to wind up. And in case they have damaged any way, uh, to the citizens, they have also been asked to uh, pay compensation because it is they uh, who have polluted the environment, they have damaged harms to the health and environment uh, of the community. Now, what then we see is uh, that the RTI, uh, through its impact on good governance, has also positively been impacting the development indicators and people are able to exercise their right to know and seek accountability of the government. And there are areas which are not to be disclosed if it is a matter of national interest or commercial confidence or relating to third party information. Those aspects are barred from disclosure and it is for the information commissions to decide whether or not the disclosure of information is to be put in public domain. So what we see is that there is unprecedented uh, level of disclosure of information that is enabling the people to effectively participate and even question the politicians and the bureaucracy and as a result the uh, corruption is minimized, the siphoning of funds for the private users is minimized and that is being allocated for the development pro projects and uh, that is uh, showing a better sign of improvement in government services. So what we see is that in the last three years or so India has uh, attained a rate of growth of about 8% or so, which is unprecedented. And this also coincides with the implementation of RTI Act and good governance, which is also reflected. And in the, in the, the last three years, we also see that the reduction in the poverty percentage points, in terms of percentage points, has also doubled. And it shows uh, that uh, the implementation of RTI Act has uh, has contributed to the development process uh, through improvement in good governance. With this, uh, uh, we feel that if uh, the benefits of uh, right to information is to be optimized by way of encouraging the people's participation in development, then it is important uh, that, <coughs> that all the social economic projects must incorporate transparency and accountability norms so that the beneficiaries are the affected persons and the parties, the NGOs, they can ask for the reasons, for the grounds, why certain action has been taken and with what consequences. So wherever it has happened, as I mentioned to you in some of the programs like uh, um, uh, rural employment guarantee scheme or the benefit, uh, for, uh, benefits for the education, health care, and uh, old age pension, etc. we find that the benefits are reaching almost 100%. So likewise, if the target population is identified for each and every program, and people are aware of what they are entitled for, and if they are made uh, aware of how to seek for their entitlements, it would be possible to see that the maximum benefit goes to them, and the people will be able to ask for and create effective demand for the services that are assured to them by the government. This will, of course, require developing capacities for uh, providing information. So use of internet services, use of uh, web-based services, use of ICC, uh, ICTs would be very much important for wider dissemination of information uh, and knowledge, which the UNESCO has also been uh, promoting. At the same time, it is also important to educate the people, especially the poor, uh, as to what they should asking for, how they should be asking for, and where from, and how to make use of the information. Because uh, we have seen uh, re re very recently that only 10% of the India's poor have, uh, have some information about their right to know. 90% of them are not aware. But still, of those who have been using RTI, at least 20% of those are uh, from those who are below the poverty line. And in rural areas, 30% of the information seekers are the poor. And this is how the benefits are reaching to a larger section. And finally, I would say that uh, approaches to uh, mass awareness, 
information literacy has to be increased. At the same time, it has been also noted that wherever the NGOs and the self-help groups are dominant and they are active, it is in those areas uh, the programs, economic programs have been effectively used. A point was raised in the morning in some other session uh, that a, a large number of uh, journalists, uh, the media persons are being uh, humiliated and have also been killed. It has also been noticed that a large number of uh, RTI users are also being harassed by uh, different uh, vested interests uh, and they are uh, affected. And in that context, we have found that wherever the NGOs and the self-help group are coming forward, uh, which uh, uh, doesn't uh, identify the individuals, uh, there we find that the success rate is very high. But when the individuals are identified, that there are chances that they may be harassed, humiliated, and they also may be harmed. Uh, so the role of NGO uh, in the whole matter is very uh, much important. Finally, endorsing what the UNESCO has been doing, the democratization of knowledge resources is indeed very critical for empowerment of people to enable them to realize their entitlements. Therefore, a strengthening of information regime is signed to a non for promoting democratic government, uh, governance as well as right to development. Thank you very much. Of how a well done right to information act can actually mean a lot of progress, not just for the individuals, but also for the sense of democracy and for active participation in democracy in the country. We'll now go to, uh, to have another perspective on the access side. I'm going to ask our next panelist, uh, Niklas Lundberg, uh, from Sweden, to, uh, to take the floor. Niklas is the European Union Policy Manager uh, of Google, and he will, where Professor Ansari was giving us the perspective from the, the governmental point of view, so to say, he will uh, take the perspective from the private sector and from a large uh, uh, information technology organization, and where I think uh, Professor Ansari was fighting against the culture of secrecy. I, I think maybe uh, Mr. Lundberg will be fighting for a culture of openness, and we would like to hear a little bit more about that looks at uh, from, from the point of Google. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that kind introduction. So. What I would like to do here today is that I would like to draw from the experience that we have as a company on commercial reuse and access to information. And I would like to go through three different legal regimes and then point out some of the basic problems that we have been seeing all over the world when it comes to access to information and what can possibly be done about them because I think that they're incredibly important for development in many different senses, not least those pointed out by the previous speaker, uh, Professor Ansari, in, in his presentation. So the three regimes I would like to highlight that all regulate access to information is firstly the European Directive on Public Sector Information. This directive was uniquely conceived for commercial reuse and access of public sector information and it contains a large number of rules and a large number of recommendations on how uh, public sector information should be reused. Firstly, we have the particular problem which we encounter everywhere of how to define public sector information. So it is all well and good to say that there should be access to public sector information or publicly held information, but there needs to be a very rigorous definition of that available. If you look at the European Directive, for example, um, they define this as existing documents held by public sector bodies of the member state which is a fairly wide definition and uh, sometimes uh, even so wide that it is hard for the agencies or bodies that are supposed to follow the rules to actually know if something they are in the possession of is a existing document or not, which is kind of entertaining. So to this rule, the European Union has decided to amend a number of exceptions. These exceptions severely limit the usability of the directive. The first one, of course, is that if a document is held by a public body outside of the public task that that body has, it's not considered publicly held information. Secondly, if it is a document where third parties have intellectual property rights, it's not considered a public document. If it is a document that pertains to the protection of national security, statistical or commercial confidentiality, it is again not publicly held information. 
if it is a document held by public service broadcasters, it is not publicly held information. If it is a document held by educational or research establishments, it is not a publicly held information. If it is a document held by cultural establishments, it is again not publicly held information. As you understand, this directive offers very little usefulness from a term of development, where, for example, education or different kinds of research or access to knowledge would be one of the chief main pieces of any kind of policy. So the directive is exclusively concentrating on commercial reuse. It sets up a few rules of procedure. Um, when a request is received by a public body, it should respond, if at all possible, electronically. It should give a license within a reasonable time. The directive mentions 20 days as reasonable. If they deny access, they should explain and there should be the right of redress and appeal. Conditions under which you are allowed to reuse under the directive are that you should, if at all possible, get this in electronic format. And I think this is important. Even if I know that in many countries electronically available information will not be an option at all, I think that where it is available or where that is an option, it is a huge help for transparency. Um, secondly, they set out rules for principles for pricing. And this is important, I think. Even though when we speak of public access to publicly held information, we usually think that there should be no cost involved. Almost everywhere, there is a cost imposed on they who request that information. So what regime you choose for cost or for pricing is extremely important. The European Union has chosen what is usually called the cost recovery scheme, which means that every public body should be able to charge the exact amount it costs them to produce that information. Now, this is diametrically different from, for example, the US, who have chosen a model usually referred to as the marginal cost of distribution. That is, they will only charge citizens what it costs them to distribute the information, not produce it. And these small but important decisions will actually decide very much of uh, the level of public access you gain, both commercially and non-commercially, so they're important for, for both perspectives. You could, of course, decide that any kind of public access should be cost-free. That would be a radical uh, decision. But very few countries um, have, as far as we have seen, decided this even for their individual citizens. Uh, there are also requirements on openness, standardized licenses, and, of course, that there should be no discrimination and competition. So this is the first legal regime I would like to mention. It's a European legal regime. It's for commercial reuse. The second one is something called the OECD recommendation of the Council for Enhanced Access and More Effective Use of Public Sector Information. It was adopted by the OECD countries in Seoul this summer, and it sets out a series of rules on how to enhance access and more effectively allow reuse for information. This does not limit itself to commercial reuse. This is reuse in any kind of way. It's a access in any kind of way. The principles set out by the OECD include openness, Trans transparent access and reuse conditions, asset lists, and this is incredibly important. As I will return to later, there is no use of having a principle of public access if you don't know what you have access to. Really important stuff. Quality of the information, also an enormously important factor. If there is public access to information, and you know what information it is, but you do not know the quality, when it was last updated, for example, or what kind of information, how it was generated, collected. If you have no of those, none of those variables on the table, it's very hard to assess the quality of the information. Integrity, how do you know that this information has not been tampered with? Again, the OECD sets out a number of rules and recommendations on how to ensure the integrity of the information. If you really want to rule out corruption, of course, you should make sure that the body of public information you're allowing access to cannot be tampered with. Otherwise, corruption will simply move one step backwards to the level of generation of public in, in, in information. Again, long-term preservation, archives, archival principles are also extremely important when it comes to public information. The usefulness of a principle of public access, if archives do not exist, is very, very low. Next point they have is that they think it's, there's a need to enhance access even if there is a third party copyright holder. They think that pricing should at least strive towards the marginal cost distribution model. 
they believe it would be good with competition where there is commercial reuse. So if you allow for commercial reuse, which I think is good also for a development perspective, because there is definitely a market in providing information about what public bodies do. They, re um, they uh, provide the rules on redress mechanisms, how to design public-private partnerships for digitization. Again, a very important area where UNESCO is very active. Where, where I also think that um, there's a huge gain to be made by public-private partnerships in digitization of cultural materials. They provide rules on international access. And this is important because when we speak of public access to information, we do, don't only speak about information held within national boundaries of a country. It could be equally important to allow, for example, the export of education from one country to another in terms of online services. It could be equally important to speak of the trade in information internationally, thus making this into an, uh, a trade-related issue, as we have pointed out previously in other uh, circumstances. So that's the second regime I'd like to point out. The third I have is the Swedish principle of public access and publicity. It's a 200-year-old process. It's common to the Scandinavian countries. And this principle basically says that you have, as a citizen of Sweden, right of access to all official documents that have not been classified. That means that you have the right to partake of a wide variety of documents. Among those documents you have the right to partake of are tax returns, school grades, not only of officials, but every other citizen, the email logs of officials, the cookies set on computers of officials. It's an incredibly wide principle. It's not designed at all for commercial reuse, but it is uh, one of the perhaps oldest principles of publicity or public access in the world. Now, it's interesting to have all these three legal regimes in mind when I speak about the problems we encounter. Because if you take a country like Sweden, I'm going to use Sweden as an example, they have signed on to the OECD recommendations, they are party to the European Directive on Public Sector Information, and they have a 200-year-old established principle of public access. Yet still, the problems I mentioned are encountered in this country all the time. So they could be relevant problems to any country trying to develop their own regime of public access. Now, among the lessons we find is that asset lists, as I previously mentioned, are enormously important. We need to have them for every public agency in order to make sure that we know what kind of information they hold. The second problem we encounter very often is legacy licenses, material within public bodies which has been licensed from a third party and they're not allowed. You will not allow transformative use in many cases. So if you are allowed to license, for example, a map, you're not allowed to do what you want with that map. You must keep it in one format because of the licenses afforded under the public access or the PSI directive. So, my recommendations or the lessons I think that we have learned, and I think they're applicable also to uh, developing a regime of public access in all countries, not only developing countries, but developed countries as well, is again, we need to have asset lists, structured asset lists, and if we provide this information online, I would strongly recommend the use of sitemaps we know that in the US, for example, 60% of all citizens first go to a search engine when they want to reach a public agency. So the way you look in search results will actually be the way you look to your citizens. That's your face when you speak to your citizens. And that's kind of interesting because it makes a very simple argument. You should structure the information has to be searchable everywhere. And there's a standard protocol called sitemaps which you can use, which will make you visible not only in Google, of course, but in every search engine. Second, purpose defines scope. When we discuss access to public held information, I think it's enormously important to have a really wide scope if your purpose is development. It should apply to education, it should apply to even, I think, in some cases, there should be exceptions for um, copyrighted materials because the materials can be used for development. So designing the exceptions, what is not publicly held information, is extremely important. And of course, at some point, you also have to measure access towards other values, the privacy of citizens and the availability of incentives for creating um, different kinds of information. I, only, I already mentioned the cross-border access as an important issue. To allow cross-border access to publicly held information, I think, is enormously important because I think that would foster also the global spirit in which we try to work. Thank you, Mr. Comprehensive overview of the um, 
some of the existing legal frameworks that we are leaning onto, and also the disclosure of how far behind the European Union is actually with its information, uh, right to information regime as it is right now. Thanks God, I should say, many of the individual countries have legislation which is much more progressive than the, the overall uh, legislation there. We will move on now to, to our third panelist, uh, Dr. Prasad uh, from, uh, from India. Dr. Prasad is Associate Professor at the Indian Statistical Institute. And he will know, like, like all of us, that, that any good Freedom of Information Act would, uh, would include a, a notion of proactive disclosure. It may also include uh, the aspect that public bodies should elaborate the information so that it is accessible also to, to ordinary citizens, to non-scientists. And Professor Prasad, you are a statistician, and statistics is the science pertaining to the collection, the analysis, the interpretation or explanation, and presentation of, of information. And Mr. Lundblad just, uh, Lundberg just spoke about the, the necessity of being very, very cautious with the quality when you're generating the information that will be, so to say, funneled into what is public health information. What's the quality control for the Indian Statistical Institute? What's the uh, non-tampered information that you provide to Dr. Ansari so that the ordinary Indian citizen can have access to the correct information about what goes on in this country? The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for your generous introduction. But again, unfortunately, I had to correct it. I belong to library science. Though the institute is Indian Statistical Institute, uh, I hardly know statistics. <laughs> okay. uh, though we have a division and uh, the institute uh, is, uh, can claim that uh, it is one of the first institutes uh, which emphasized on statistical quality control. Though ISOs, uh, I mean, uh, quality ones uh, are talked now from 60s, uh, the institute is working on quality control. But again, uh, as a, a library science person, I am more interested in uh, the role of libraries uh, in uh, making people aware of the information that is available. Um, in fact, uh, the yesterday discussion when I was uh, uh, an, uh, one of the audience, everybody was talking about the next billion and uh, the internet. But again, we have to accept that internet is, the information on the internet is accessible only to the educated people and the so-called computer literates. And hardly it is available to many non-literates and even those who are literates, uh, if they don't know how to use a computer or a browser, the information is not reachable. Okay, so <clears throat> I would like to be, touch upon uh, three aspects. One is the philosophical issues and the Indian context and the role of public libraries, okay? And then um, it's interesting to listen to uh, Nick about uh, the, the scope of public information, but uh, I would like to extend the scope uh, uh, to the private sector information also of the industry, private industry, and other things. After all, private industry is part of the society, and people have every right to know how it is functioning. Because we know in India, there are many controversies that uh, the, the way some of the industry is unscrupulously uh, leaving a lot of uh, pollution into the rivers, and how much they are leaving out, and uh, whether they have their own self-assessment of uh, how much uh, pollutants they are releasing and uh, whether it can be questioned at some point uh, and their claims and rather false claims. So that way I feel uh, the, the public health information, not only the government, uh, even the private sector information also should be made available to the public. Next. Okay. So I mean public organizations and here uh, Dr. Ansari has mentioned uh, the benefits of uh, the government plans and uh, when through RTI, when the act is implemented, how much benefit uh, India has, the Indian public has uh, achieved by making uh, RTI implemented. 
So any organization which is uh, using public money should be made, the information about them should be made available. Next slide. <coughs> So the industry also, as I have pointed out, uh, it is part of the society. It can have both uh, positive and negative impact on the society, just as the government also can have positive and negative impact on the society. People should be able to access its merits so that they can assess its presence in the society, whether it is valid to be existent, I mean, uh, to exist further, and whether it is harmful to have such an industry around, or even it is harmful to have such a government around. We know that political philosophers like John Locke used it to argue how to recall the government if, uh, if the subjects find it uh, uh, more harmful to the public. Next. <clears throat> so we know that uh, the Right to Information Act uh, uh, has actually, when I went through, one condition that uh, RTA Act of India includes uh, information relating to any private body which can be accessed by public authority. That me, I, I really do not know, of course, Dr. Ansari would be the right person to tell whether RTA can be extended to uh, information about the private industry or private business organizations. Next. So we know that uh, this is uh, a very, very, very thin line to differentiate. Uh, I know that many people try to say that this is secrecy, just as Ansari has mentioned that uh, in the name of official secrecy, everything is kept secret from the public. So very difficult to, I mean, define what is uh, secure information, what is insecure information, what can be extended, and appeals, of course, uh, would be there finally. It is true, but again, if you look into the RTI site of uh, the India, the, somewhere it is written, Appeals can be answered as there are many, many appeals. It may take almost a year to address to the appeals. That means if somebody doesn't give information and if we finally approach the commission, and we know that in, the Indi in India the judicial system is uh, highly, highly um, delayed justice. Okay. Some of the cases run into decades. And though it is uh, the shortage of uh, the judges or anything. So if RTI demands uh, within a month, uh, the answer should be provided by the organization. But commission almost, I think, piling up a lot of complaints. OK, next. <coughs> so <coughs> the, the philosophical questions, rather political philosophical questions are, uh, how the subjects, uh, the governments got in alienated with the, with the subjects. We know that in the democracy, it is the people who elect the government. But uh, in practice, uh, most of the time, what happens is uh, the government uh, employees, they, be, they behave, they are the custodians of law, and their job is to protect law, and as if the entire subjects are criminals, and they, they dictate terms to the public, rather than uh, they have forgotten, they are funded by the public and uh, they are answerable to the public. That way, RTI is uh, a, a big progress in the direction where uh, people are also equipped to question back. So definitely, as uh, he has uh, uh, given statistical figures, transparency is very, very important, okay? I mean, and I always believe, though, it goes um, uh, too much uh, stretching. Uh, why should one uh, have secrecy? Even private information, unless I did something, I don't have to be secretive about uh, my activities. Okay, uh, Probably that is uh, too wide a definition of, uh, which removes practically what is, there is nothing called private information. But uh, these definitions, we know that uh, are highly debatable. <clears throat> okay, so transparency definitely is the first step because it uh, ensures answerability and objectiveness and unbiasedness, as he has pointed out, whether some contract is given uh, uh, objectively or whether uh, some kickbacks were there around in spite of uh, the award uh, is not being compensated.
competent and reducing state power, power centered approach. Okay, state is uh, looked as uh, a powerful organization which is uh, practically scaring the ordinary citizens. Okay, I mean, like uh, something like uh, Leviathan of Th Thomas Hobbes, uh, if, uh, Hobbes, if you look in, I think states should be, should not be, I think, uh, a, an imposing power. After all, it is meant for the people. So we know that uh, there is a world edo that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, uh, absolutely. But again, obviously, this uh, they meant the people having power, but not the, the general public. Next. 